I'm very happy to lead this conversation as a proud woman in tech. Um, I have had a long journey. So I want to introduce our panel. Um, I will let them to, to, to introduce themselves. Uh, so we have Serene, Courtney, and Obarshni. Um, they're going to be introducing themselves uh, before we start the conversation. So why you don't start, uh, Serene, to introduce yourself. I was hoping you'd pick me second <laughs> so that I could kind of build on where I went first. Um, but that's all right. I can lead. Um, well, you're in Calgary, so go first. <laughs> I, I am in Calgary. Uh, so I, I'm not a UX designer. I'm a software developer by trade. Um, I also run the YYC Dev and the YYC JS meetup groups. I own a company called Pixel Tree. We're a pillar company with Platform Calgary. And we help startup founders build their tech. We're really invested in the education of entrepreneurs uh, with regard to software. And we also do a lot of mentorship with junior developers. Um, it was never one of my uh, core goals to have a really diverse team, but it, I think it just, uh, when you have a diverse leader, you, your team just kind of ends up really diverse. And so we have a lot of these conversations within our organization um, about biases and diversity, uh, what that means to us and, and how we're applying it uh, going forward in our company. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thanks to for the invitation. It's a, definitely a privilege. Look, looking forward to hear your input as a leader in uh, diverse teams. Um, Courtney, you're next. <laughs> Welcome to the conversation. <laughs> Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Courtney Botini and I am a design manager at Snap. Uh, the company that owns Snapchat and a myriad of other verticals. Um, I live in Seattle, Washington, so I'm probably one of the few non-Canada Calgary folks here, but kind of, you know, up north-ish. Um, I am focused on leading a team that is managing our platform design at Snap. Um, it's a vertical team that really thinks about how design plays out holistically across all of our domains. Um, and I am just really thrilled to be here and you know have this conversation, share some of my experience on just bias in the tech industry, and hopefully share some like insights that can help others deal with it. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you, Courtney. Welcome. Yeah, now looking forward. Uh, all, all the companies that are inside of Snapchat is, is interesting to hear uh, how you manage all, all the all those products. <laughs> um, or or Varshi, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, definitely. Hi, everyone. I'm Ravashi Sharma, and I'm a senior product designer at RBC uh, in Toronto. Um, I'm also a part-time UX product design instructor at General Assembly. Um, and interestingly enough, I actually just uh, ended class uh, prior to, to coming to this event today. So it's, it's definitely been a jam-packed International Women's Day, but one that I'm, I'm definitely very happy with and uh, really happy to be a part of this event. So thanks, thanks for having me and looking forward to, to the discussions. Um, thank you. Um, so, well, let's start this, um, this event. Um, I just want to say that I, I am happy to be leading this conversation. Um, as many know, I'm part of a cheeky community and I have been part of these conversations about for four years. And these conversations have helped me to be brave and move forward to my career. Um, at some stage in my life, I was like, should I keep going? Should I stop? Motherhood came to my life. So these conversations helped me to be brave and go for it. Um, listening to other women's journey has helped me a lot. And second, uh, I have been breaking my own bias because we are the first one that we put it on. So hearing other women uh, solving their problems and going for the challenges help us uh, help, uh, breaking our bias. So I hope somebody takes out from this conversation today. Um, so I'm going to start, of course, with a very big question to open <laughs> this conversation. Um, so the first question uh, is going to be, how was your process to get out of your comfort zone and proceed to build your career? In this answer, can you give us a little bit of your first challenges to understand and how you tackle them? So I don't know, it's a volunteer to start before I point on one. Um, who is ready to answer that big question? <laughs> 
I could I could start uh, if if that works. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, go so, ahead. So definitely, uh, when it comes to my comfort zone, it it really reminds me of of the way I grew up. So I I moved countries every three years, and this was really as a child. So moving every three years really got me to be out of my comfort zone, to be in situations where. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to be a part of it, moving schools every three years, being around different kinds of people. Um, so really having, having sort of experienced uh, or been a part of such experiences from a very young age uh, really encouraged me to kind of keep that cycle going. And even I find um, today, even in today's world or, you know, these times, um, I'll subconsciously sign myself up for tasks or things that I'm uncomfortable with. And, and get myself to, to go out of my comfort zone. And for me, I think it, it really goes back to growth. I know that uh, in order to experience growth, I have to be out of my comfort zone. Uh, it's, it's always great to be comfy in a nice little bubble, but, um, but really uh, being able to force myself to be out of, out of this, this comfortable bubble, known bubble, something that, that's very uh, comfortable to be a part of has led me to experience growths that that I wouldn't have uh, otherwise. So uh, definitely encourage everyone to to try it, you know, to try something new. I know that that's part of UX, something that we embrace, try something new. Um, so it's it's something that that has been very valuable to me and, and highly encourage everyone to to try. Um, and, you know, if you, if you never try, you'll you'll really never know. Um, so definitely would love to hear um, Serene and Courtney's uh, responses as well. Yeah, thank you. Sounds like you like the, the feeling of uncomfortable. That sounds like something new is coming. <laughs> Courtney, looks like you're ready. <laughs> uh, I am ready. I feel like really fortunate because so much of my career has been being like thrown into the deep end of the pool and uncomfortable decisions made for me that had I been driving like in control, I may not have made those decisions, but once they were made for me, it really started to show me the power of being in uncomfortable positions and like taking those and learning from them. And so now that I've like had the opportunity to face lots of like ambiguous abstract types of challenges and problems, I'm really appreciative that I had people kind of push me in that direction because without them, I think I would have stayed really safe and I think I would have stayed really stagnant in my career. So I feel like, again, just to mirror, like it is critical to try new and uncomfortable things, but like I also recognize that can be challenging, it can feel unsafe, it can feel scary. And so like know when to get support, but also like push yourself because otherwise you're really not going to be able to move forward. I think you mentioned something very important. Uh, look for the support so you don't feel like you're just throwing yourself alone. So that's a very, very good insight. Uh, be brave, get out, but look for support. <laughs> yeah, if you're being thrown into the deep end of the pool, it's always good to know you have like a life jacket nearby. Like find those people that are there to support you and help you and like give yourself the opportunity to swim. But I feel like, you know, knowing that you're not going to drown is also important. I know how to ask for the help too, right? Like to, 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 to say a little bit assistant here. <laughs> and, and like, just to be really clear, like there's no shame in asking for help. You know, I feel like having that self-awareness, understanding what your skill set is, what your capabilities are, are really important for you to know, like just how you can be useful. And I think when people ask for help, I always find that to be incredibly like powerful because it's basically like, dropping the ego and just saying, I know that I need this, but it's not like uh, necessarily a negative thing. It's just like, I want to do the best. And I am like looking for those to help fill in the puzzle pieces. We are well human. <laughs> okay, Serene, your turn. <laughs> just stop me if I start talking too much. It happens a lot. <laughs> um, I, this is a really hard question for me because I think that my the things that make me uncomfortable are not necessarily the same things that make everybody else uncomfortable i find that the challenges in the workplace um like the work that we actually need to get done it's it's challenging but i don't feel uncomfortable i actually really really thrive when stuff is really hard uh the things that get me out of my comfort zone are things like having to be uh having to be imperfect 
um, admitting when I've failed or admitting that I can't do something. Those are the things that really, really pushed me to be, to, to have to find courage. Um, so it, it's, it's stuff like that, which is, um, I think it was a really interesting insight for me to have when I was thinking about this question um, is that the, you know, I, I, I don't struggle with the challenges at work. Um, you know, our teams are always going to have, have challenges. We're always going to have uh, stuff with clients that we need to deal with. But when I hit a roadblock or I'm like, I need to ask for help, that's what like, that's really, really wrenches at me. So. Um, well, I think I have, I mean, including myself, uh, sometimes you are so hard in yourself, so perfect with yourself that you put your own blocks. So that's another big um, challenge to get out of that comfort that, okay, I don't know everything. I'm not going to perfect. I'm not going to have 100. <laughs> Let's step out a little bit and, and ask for that help and, and be vulnerable. I think be vulnerable is that is a thing that we need to let us be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, we are strong. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move to the next question. Um, do you think uh, it took you longer or extra steps to reach your current position because of your gender, ethnicity, social, economic, or even motherhood? I think Serene is in uh, the motherhood. Uh, I don't know who else is, but it's the only one I remember. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or pointed out. Um, so you think it took you longer to reach or extra steps because of any of these um, bias? Looks like Serene is ready to answer. I'm always ready to answer. That's why I was like, can't <laughs> get me stop talking. Um, I think definitely. Um, I think from a gender perspective, maybe not as much as others because I obviously can be a little bit like, pretty aggressive. Um, and when I need to fit in with the boys, it, that has not really been an issue. But I found that as a leader and an entrepreneur, I've definitely struggled a little more along the way. Um, and I, I don't find the, the business guys to be as accepting of women as the software developer guys. Um, and like as a, as a mom, definitely there are some biases against moms. I don't think there's anything intentional, but things like uh, resume gaps or just like accessibility to events. Um, it's, they're often held at times when moms are doing things like getting their kids to school in the morning, right? Like they can't go to morning breakfast. They're taking their kids to school. They're packing lunches. And it's really hard for them to go to evening events because they're making dinner and getting their kids to bed. And so I think that that means that moms and women Oh, we lose you. Uh, the... Sorry, are you still yeah. good? Oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah, yeah so um, I think that moms just end up having less access to events and opportunities and networks and stuff, not not intentionally, but just as a side effect. Just to be more present. Yes. <laughs> okay, Kearney, what about you? Oh, this one's spicy <laughs> for me. So uh, I all like, start this off by saying I come from an extreme place of privilege. I am a white woman. I am from like a mid-class, like socioeconomic background. And so I've had a lot of opportunities in my life, but I do feel like as a female, I have experienced bias that has really caused like multiple extra steps. And that's really just been in like growth opportunities. And I've worked at a, a variation of different companies um, in tech and in the agency world. And this is like just my personal experience. But when I have had male managers, I have had to fight to be advocated for to grow. And when I've had female managers, I feel like they are fighting for me and advocating for me to grow. And so like the luxury is when I've had female managers, I feel like they put so much work in to pull me up the ladder, but there aren't a ton of female leadership. Like it's just an unbalanced scale. And so oftentimes you have male management that I felt like I had to just really try and like beg to see my value. Whereas when I had female leads, they were like, you're amazing. And I'm going to like do the work to bring you along. 
Totally, I can feel you. <laughs> Um, I will go with uh, Rubashi. Oh, I need to read them. <laughs> Sorry, Rubashi. Uh, but Diana will get it. <laughs> I don't know how to read it. <laughs> Rubashi. Yeah, definitely. No and, worries. And then I will follow up with another question with this one for the three of you. Yeah, uh, for me, really, the, the time that I can think of was um, when I had just graduated from, uh, from college. Um, and I was actually looking for my very first uh, full-time opportunity or just my very first job. Um, and it was the year of the recession, so I will never know. <laughs> I tried for many years to, to find a job and I'll never know if it was uh, due to uh, bias, whether of my background, uh, regarding you know, whether the fact that uh, perhaps it's a female applying for a position uh, or whether it really was the recession. Um, but, um, but as, as Courtney had mentioned, um, I, in, in my case, I've had male managers mainly, um, but I have seen what strong, uh, leadership looks like, especially when, uh, when I've seen sort of female, uh, females in leadership. Um, so, so for me, I, I have kind of experienced, uh, things a little bit differently. I, I think at, at, at one point, if I were to reflect back on those times, uh, when I was looking for my very first job, I will never know if it was the recession or if it was uh, perhaps due to, 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 to gender bias or, uh, you know, my ethnicity. I, I wish I could look at this interstellar style in a few years, you know, go back in moments in time and, and, uh, and figure it out. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of been my journey uh, with this uh, so far. Thank you. So now my next question is, um, I relate in every of the three answers. Um, uh, I, when I gave my notice that I was a mom, I get contract related, but then they told me, you're not going to be as a present. Your position is going to be on risk when you're back. Like you're going to be tending your kids and everything, but we're happy for you. And then they give, didn't give me a little shit because I was going to maternity leave. Um, the same thing when if I have uh, females, I feel like, um, appreciated and seeing my skills and everything. Um, lucky when I'm working, it's a diverse, so I haven't felt that, but in the past. So do you have any advice, comment, how these companies, this leader can avoid, is not pushing us down, but is not giving us opportunity, no seeing our skills, like do you have any thoughts about how these leaders in these companies can support us maybe in our careers so we don't have to do these extra steps. We don't have to be present all the time. We don't need to be kind of fighting for a spot constantly is how it feels sometimes. So do you have any thoughts or it's a very big question. <laughs> My initial take is like, I, want to have the perspective in life that most people are good people and they're trying their best. But this bias often is unintentional and it feels like extra work and to be frank, like a pain in the ass that it should be any of our responsibility. But I will say I've had the best experience when I've been able to help educate and like share trainings, guidance, just perspective on what it's like. And that isn't always well received. Um, and again, like it feels frustrating that I have to be the one to continue educating while I'm fighting. <laughs> it's just more emotional labor that I'm taking on. But I think that without it, like people are going to miss that perspective. Like male leadership will never truly understand this experience because they're not going through life in this like form. Um, and so like if we can have real conversations and hopefully like build a sense of empathy that can help them start to make decisions that are more welcoming and supportive, but like grain of salt, that takes work from them too, if they're willing to do that. Hopefully you work for a company with leaders that are good people. Yeah, thank you, I agree. <laughs> Anyone, Shireen? Vashi, do you have any inputs? Or <laughs> I, think, um, I think cultural things like this really have to come from the top down. And it also speaks to the importance. Um, 
it's, I think it's really important to have women in leadership and this is why. It's because those kinds of messages have to come from the top down. It gets really, really hard as a worker to try to push for that type of culture change upwards. And that's why we need to see more women on, on boards as well and more women in leadership and more women, women in management. Um, they, it's, it's not just gonna be based on their gender because there are already, like, I'm sure we've all had bad female bosses as well. Um, but I think just having women there who've had these experiences, who've been through this are gonna give that additional perspective to the team. Yeah, the, the education as you're uh, pointing it out. Yeah. Uh, what about any input? <laughs> Yeah, for me, it's it's uh, actually what's already been covered, so strong leadership, and I think that that's reflective in the team's culture. Uh, it's it's very interesting, you know, when uh, when you, you sort of join a company and and sort of subconsciously or consciously you pick up on on cues, you know, what is the team culture like? What are conversations uh, that are acceptable, maybe not acceptable? So I think if if this is something uh, that, you know, comes from uh, leadership, especially having women in leadership, uh, cultivating this sort of positive culture, cultivating an inclusive, diverse culture, I think that that in turn sort of trickles down to individual team cultures. And I think that that really plays uh, a big role in, uh, in, in really how we, how we see things, how we experience things. Good, yeah, great, thank you. Um, and it's good to see every time more women in leadership and trying to, to do this change for the top. <laughs> um, so my next question is like, I, I call it emotional, emotional intelligence um, is, in the situation that you have been, in the challenges and um, the extra steps that you have, have, have you have learned or you need to learn how to put yourself out of, this is because it's me as a person, put yourself out and read the room, read the situation. And it's more like, it's not me as a person, it's I have to raise my voice. I need to show what is acceptable, but it's not like I'm the one that is, um, rejected or no feeling like I don't know if my question is making sense so like have to learn how the emotional intelligence is not to take everything personal as a you instead of be in a world more main opportunities who wants to answer that I'll go <laughs> <laughs> thank you Serene. um this is a this is a really important question to me I, um, since I got divorced, I've spent like a ton of time in therapy over the, like, like the past six years, just learning about uh, myself and the way that I react to certain situations. Um, I think that if I'd learned these things as a child or just like way younger, I'd, I'd be way more, like way better equipped to deal with these situations now. Um, women in particular also take a lot of things personally. And I think we see negative responses as a reflection of our value. Um, and, then, and then that leads into us feeling unworthy and unlovable if we aren't providing enough value. And so it's my, I was sad the other day and my son wrote me a letter and in it, it says, mom, being you is all you need to be to be loved. And oh I wish goodness. that, I, I know, I'm gonna frame <laughs> it. Uh, and I wish that I could have said that as a child. Um, and I, I wish I could tell everybody this because once they, once people and women truly believe that they are able to separate their value as people from the work that they're doing. And that really helps to put things into perspective. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, very nice. I'm good, good learning. We always learn from the little ones. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, give, give us a value. And I think is when we be more trained, like we lose the value ourselves. So um, Courtney, are you ready? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I mean, to, <laughs> to just like plus one what Serene said, I think, you know, there's a lot of doubt that we have, and that's not specific to being a female, that's just the human experience. But I feel like there's a lot of doubt that I've personally experienced on like, am I good enough for this? And so any form of critique or criticism just 
it hits so hard. But when you get to the point where you truly believe in yourself, where you see your value, where you start to like tease away the emotional side of it from like the reality side, it allows you to in, like approach those situations without fear. And I feel really like it, it's important to do the work to not just like love yourself, but to truly know like what skills are valuable. I always use this metaphor and I'm sorry, cause it's going to be ridiculous, but like, it, it's how I would mentor people on, um, advocating for like a fair compensation package for pay. We are pizzas. And if you have like the supreme toppings on your pizza, your pizza just costs more money. Like you've got all of the good stuff on it. And so I feel like once you recognize that you're a supreme pizza, it makes it so much easier to walk in the room and be like, I've got all the goods. And what like whatever's happening around you, if there are emotional responses, that's not on you. That's like somebody else's thing to own. You know, you're secure and you're supreme with pizza self. I love it. I really like it. Uh, Because sometimes we are so focused about to be competitive that we forgot that we have all the toppings already. Totally. (laughs) Urbashi. Yeah, there's there's a few things to 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 add to this really. Um, I I know that uh, you know that there was a time in my life when I would really overthink things because uh, being being a designer, uh, empathy really is something that uh, that uh, I've embraced uh, you know since since childhood. Being able to understand other people's positions and be, you know being able to under, uh, to to place myself in other people's shoes. Um, so sometimes that can almost be a negative because when you're in a conversation, you're in, in a room or as part of, part of a room, you can actually start to zoom out and start thinking, okay, well, what is this person thinking of me? What is this person thinking of me? And really overthink the entire situation and start thinking, you know, okay, well, how should I have responded? You know, what, what should have happened? Um, and I think that being able to, uh, you know, practice empathy, being able to, to understand other people's uh, uh, sort of views, opinions, um, it, it's great. But then exactly what, what Courtney just said, um, you know, being able to know that, yes, given that time situation that, you know, what, uh, what sort of stance you had, uh, what response you had held value. Um, and that that you did the best you could. Uh, it's it's very easy to to have this sort of emotional intelligence and and overthink things. It's it's definitely something that can that can bring you down in the end. Uh, so being able to to know your worth and say you know uh, I I did the best I could and and I knew. Um, so it it's definitely something that is that has helped. And I'm putting an amazing pizza in the middle of the table. <laughs> a supreme one, lovely. I love this answer. Um, and, and this advice to everyone. Um, I'm going to move to another question that has been asked a lot of times. And every time I learn more from experience from other women. Um, as a UX designer, you always learn about everybody has the same voice in the table. Everybody's ideas are important. Everybody needs to be listened. Um, everybody has an input. Uh, it's no bad ideas. All this as a UX designer, you have been told and told and told. But then you go to your first work or to a table that your voice is not there. Um, any experience how has been your voice? Um, do you have to put extra work to present your work, your ideas, your presentation um, to get attention or respect of the team? How has been your experience in regards raising your voice? in a table. And more now that we're remote. <laughs> I have to be jumping more. <laughs> um, or Rashi, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, definitely. Um, so for me, I've, I've always been that person who will, uh, who will be that person who will, whenever I speak, I will be the loudest person. <laughs> um, and so it's, uh, it's almost, um, you know, I have seen courses that, uh, that uh, educate others or that really empower others to hold the room, understand the room and hold the room, to be able to understand a little bit about uh, people that are part of the room and be able to, uh, to really speak um, according to their, uh, with, with their terms. Um, so, 
in in my in my opinion so far, you know, I've I've always been that person who will uh, confidently go in, and uh, sometimes it can be taken in in the wrong uh, wrong way. Uh, you know, there's the lots question. of yeah, lots, <laughs> lots of perspectives there. <laughs> yeah, how impressive! Like you're like, passionate or. <laughs> Definitely. And, and sometimes it can be taken in the wrong way because you can see that, you know, sometimes people's egos are hurt, uh, jealousy, or they think, oh, you're that person, you know, who just came in and thinks they know everything and, you know, you're, you're the you know it all type thing. But um, and, and I, I will uh, sort of, you know, wait till your next question uh, to kind of add on to this. Uh, but, uh, but definitely being able to, you know, read the room and, uh, and be able to know, you know, how to kind of respond accordingly or how to be able to share ideas, I think is, uh, it's something very important. Yeah. Yeah. Read the room is, I think is very important for, for us to know how to, to raise a voice. Um, Courtney. <laughs> so I, I have like. I think maybe a just like a special take on this. So it, I've taken a lot of personality tests and from a strength finder test, my like top score for years has always been I'm a woo, which means my thing that I'm really good at is winning over others. And like the very first time I took that test, I was like devastated. I was like, that's the worst strength anyone ever could have. Like what a crappy thing. Like I'm just like a fake person who makes other people like me. But after time, I've, I've spent a lot of time really like digging into it. And what it means is like, I'm really good at empathizing, which is very similar. It's reading the room and being able to understand people. But I think what builds on that even further and something I really recommend everyone take a class, read a book, just practice and get really comfortable with is storytelling. I don't feel like you have to be the loudest voice in the room. I don't feel like you have to be anything more than like capable of bringing people on a journey with you. And I think it's really powerful and it allows you to help change the direction of people's opinions if you can tell a really compelling story. And that's like coming with data, coming with the why, like being really confident in your decision because like you can tell people how you got there. And I think then it makes it a lot easier for people to be like, oh, <laughs> she knows what she's talking about. She clearly has taken this path. Like I will join her on it. And so, yeah, I feel like really getting comfortable with like, how do you want people to like, how are you going to bring them along with you will in, like enable you to be a voice in the room that's listened to and seen as like, you know, an authority. I love it. Yeah, that storytelling, right? Another big trait for um, UX um, storytelling and have all the data and be able to drive people and grab the interest. Yeah, totally. Serene. People usually listen to me when I talk. Um, I think I'm pretty aggressive. Uh, I, I definitely subscribe to the storytelling thing. Um, as I was thinking about this, I, I was thinking about where I've struggled with having my voice heard. And I mean, I, I created my own company so that I wouldn't have that problem anymore. Um, and it's, it's one of the values in our company to make sure that everybody does get a seat at the table and everybody is heard. Obviously not everybody's gonna have you know, what they want, but they're definitely going to be heard. And we want to make sure that people always feel heard. So where I don't feel heard is in sometimes in, at community events, there are a lot of, it can, it can be very tech bro sometimes. Um, and I'll be the only woman. There are some, there was an event um, a couple months ago where people assumed that I wasn't, I was just somebody's girlfriend who was like tagging along and I, I wasn't actually there on my own merit. And so that made me really mad um and it actually threw me off because it, they they kind of talked down to me it's like oh who are you here with and I was like I don't understand your question um I feel like I wish I had a smart ass remark for him at the time I I was like no I'm not here with like anybody I'm I am an entrepreneur at the event and he's like oh okay but in hindsight, I wish I had some smart ass thing to reply to him with. Um, I, do, I don't know how to handle those situations yet. Um, I think we have to maybe target women more in the events where there aren't enough women. Um, but that's really the only place where I recently haven't had my voice heard. So, 
any um, how we can improve the, this bias um, to be able to be ourselves and be heard. Uh, I mean, I don't have a, a leadership position right now, but uh, I'm learning from a very good woman leader. I have my my boss has been my example, and I'm learning from her. Um, and what I have learning is like she first listen and read the room, and then she speaks. Do you have any other um, advice how to improve this bias and we don't have to be perceived as aggressive? <laughs> I think it's super powerful to call out other women in the room um, and to like give them credit. You know, I think that is so powerful when you are paying attention and making sure that everyone is getting airspace because sometimes being loud can make other people quiet. And so like, it doesn't necessarily mean like point out someone like you talk, but like making sure that you're making space and opportunity for people. And also like, if you've heard ideas or something's been shared with you, giving people credit, because I think that gives them, you know, the ability to like speak up in that space and know that they've already been seen and heard elsewhere. And we are a very introvert uh, work environment. So giving the credit and give it that uh, is very important. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just, just to add to that, I think it's um, important to establish psychological safety uh, within teams. And oftentimes that's, that's just, it just doesn't exist. And I think that it kind of, again, boils down to culture, team culture. Uh, what are some of your core principles? What are some of your core values? Are you including every voice in the room, whether that's a loud voice, whether that's someone who's perhaps a little shy, a little quieter, you know, when, when we celebrate success, when we, when we really celebrate our wins, um, it encourages everyone to participate. You know, there may be a week where someone may not want to participate. And then the next week, you know, as, as they get more comfortable, as they get to know everyone, they may feel like they want to participate. And I think that that's, it's important to establish that, that environment. Um, I know that uh, in, in the past, I've been a part of teams where that has not existed at all. Um, and I will actually take it, uh, you know, uh, on, on myself to start um, establishing psychological safety within my smaller team. I know that I can't impact the greater team, but uh, I'll, I'll start, uh, you know, cultivating that. So I think it's, it's um, if, if it's something that doesn't exist, then, you know, it's uh, definitely one individual that that's all that is required to really make change. Nice, I like a safety, yeah. And uh, I'm woman. Uh, if you're not here in that table, you can look for that safety mentally and talk to the person outside of the table. <laughs> Serene, uh, you have anything to add? I think the psychological safety thing really got me thinking. Um, one of the I think it was five dysfunctions of a team that talks about, I think the base of the pyramid is trust. Uh, for a team to really function effectively, you have to have trust. And to build that trust, there, there are different ways to do it. Um, in my company, uh, we build trust with authenticity. So people know that it's a safe environment and they can speak up and they can own up to mistakes and they can make stupid suggestions because I do it all the time. I am the first person to throw out a dumb suggestion. I'm the first person to cry in the office. I'm the first person to say something stupid. And I'll be the first person to admit when I'm wrong. And, um, and when we make this normal, it makes it okay for everybody else to come forward when they make mistakes, when they're having a bad day, when they're feeling like they don't have the answers, uh, establishing that culture of, of imperfection is really, really crucial to creating that psychological safety. So I'm really glad you brought that up. I always learn about when these, these questions. <laughs> um, so something that is in this conversation is a lot, mentioned a lot is um, women support each other so we can be more women um, in, in these careers, in this tech world. In your organizations, or how have you seen the support between women? Or how can it happen or increase? Somebody's ready. Courtney looks like she's ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I think I've been really fortunate because I've worked at a lot of places that have just had incredibly supportive women. Like I would not be in my career where I am at today if it wasn't for either support of like the people around me or like strong female leaders. They are the only ones that like dragged me up the ladder with them. Everyone else was like, bye, good luck. (laughs) But I, I have everywhere I've worked, there have been strong supportive women who are like, they see you in the room and it's like, you have an ally and that's across like growing in a company that's across like challenges there have been just really supportive teams so like I haven't necessarily seen a change more just like I've been really fortunate to have those people that are around and aware and I feel like I encourage all of us um whether you're a female or an ally to like see those people in the room um and make those connections because like that is truly how we grow through either like the influence of others through the support through the mentorship and that's what's you know been really like helpful and fortunate for me in my career yeah learning from each other and supporting each other yeah totally agree serene you have something (laughs) yeah um so my first hire at the Pixel Tree in May 2020 um, was this girl, Carolina. She's uh, one of our project managers. So she's, she's been with me basically since the start of the company. Um, I didn't hire her because she was a female and she's, she was pretty new right at university um, and she worked for me. And so like, I, was, I was listening to Courtney kind of talk about her bosses who have like really, really influenced her. And Carolina technically works uh, for me, but I've just, I found her to be really, really supportive over the last couple of years. You know, she's the one who's been like, you know, when projects fail and things, she's like, it's okay. We're going to figure it out. You know, we're going to figure this out together and we're good. You're good. You know, I got your back. You got my back. Um, and I, I would say she's kind of helped to push me along. She's, she's been one of my biggest supporters as I've started to do more speaking engagements um, and I, I don't think I would be where I am without her. And she wasn't my boss, right? She's not my boss, but uh, just, we're in each other. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Um, I, I think uh, what I mean is being an office, uh, I have my safe space with a woman at the company that we just go and to chat. We have it to be smart, intelligent talks just to chat about how my blouse looks today, so that even those supports are there. <laughs> or Vashi, what do you have for us? What do you want to add? Yeah, I think it's uh, only been uh, since my time at RBC that I've really seen what good leadership looks like. Um, and I've, been a lo- I've really been a part of a lot of teams where leadership has been subpar, I'd say mediocre. And uh, since, since I've been at RBC, I've really understood what good leadership is like, and I've been able to identify some very strong, influential female leaders, um, and uh, and actually more so, I had a uh, an amazing uh, mentor and uh, and leader who was who is a male, um, and uh, really I learned from him that you know uh, designers should should really act uh, or or service coaches be mentors. Um, and so for me, I've actually started to uh, look at myself as a mentor you know, for, for others. Um, I, I yet have to, you know, uh, sort of experience uh, strong female leadership, uh, but um, uh, more so kind of in a mentorship role, but uh, I've started the, the path of, of being a mentor uh, to others. So I think that it's, you know, it's okay if, if uh, you haven't encountered something like that, um, but, uh, but at least you can start with, with a little bit of change. Yeah. Yeah, we can start doing the change. What else? Yeah, happy to hear that you have a <laughs> a now a positive experience. I always uh, like that more companies are becoming more uh, diversity um, cultures, and and it's happening. The change is happening. So I want to be mindful for time. We are almost at the end. Um, some of the questions have been uh, already answered from the audience. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of questions so I can reach them but before I want to wrap up with any advice that you have 
either for company to have more diversity, including more women, um, or how to nav navigate those ropes if you're looking to, to have your opportunities or you're going for a leadership opportunity. So which advice can you give us um, either how companies can have more the diversity or if you are looking for a, a role opportunity, how navigate those ropes? The question to finish and currently ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I think like DEI or diversity and inclusion sometimes misses is experience. Um, and I feel like that's a really powerful way to get more women in the door. So oftentimes, I know personally, I really struggled getting into tech because my background was in visual design. And though I had years of experience solving strategic problems, it wasn't an exact one-to-one -one of the types of problems I would be solving in an in-house tech company. And it took me a really long time to break into the door. And then immediately after I did, I was really successful. And so I like want to encourage hiring managers, recruiters, companies as a whole to diversify their hiring practices to really look at not just ethnicity, gender, socioeconomical status, but like also experience um, and really start to update their interview processes to understand if people are capable of like meeting things, even if they haven't directly done them. Um, I think we're like preventing such a, a huge amount of people from being let in the door because they don't have this like little silver bow on their resume, but it, it's hindering <laughs> like that diverse population and those opinions being brought to the table. So that's my hot take. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think now with uh, UX, those interviews are more how you think more than what is in your portfolio. So maybe encourage more that, um, pay attention to how they think. <laughs> <laughs> um, Serene, looks like you are ready. I wasn't, but I'm sure I could come up with something. Um, that wasn't a very hot take. Might need some spicier takes. <laughs> spicy takes? <laughs> I don't. I don't have a ton of spicy takes. I was well. I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, um, I really struggled with it. I think that if you can try to find some allies in the organization. Um, it's, it's really hard to change people. So I, I, from the bottom up, so I would go, if it were me, I'd still go st look for some allies um, in leadership. There are, there were some men in, in the city who just really helped me out, who really believed that we needed more women representation in leadership. And they were, they were allies in, in helping me to get to that place so that um, I can, I can start influencing and, and mentoring other people to change that change that culture. Um, I, I think for hiring managers, start hiring for culture rather than resumes, like ask better questions about resume gaps uh, because you're, you're not necessarily intentionally biased against women or moms, but they just tend to have resume gaps. It's not because they weren't doing anything, it's because they were doing something else. Uh, think about why you're not hiring for that resume gap. Hire for culture, you train for skill, uh, we hire for culture all the time and we bring people on and we're like, you got three months probation. Uh, that's what the, that's what the training is for. We really, really, really like you as a person. And here's your opportunity to show us what you can learn, show us that you're coachable, um, show us that you're part of our team. And that's kind of our way of, of taking a chance, not just on, on women, but um, other people who've had other things happen in their lives um, that have not enabled them to have the same education opportunities as other people it doesn't mean that they're bad culture fits so we love those people and can you uh, give us a little bit of um insight how did you look for those uh, allies like um somebody's asking giving more resources the woman can look for those allies um so can you give any pointers or how i think I having could... like having the conversation going having to events and yeah. and bringing up the topic. I think you have to really uh, practice your courage to bring up, bring up this topic. I think women are like really 
hesitant to have that conversation outside of women only spaces because we're worried about how it's going to be perceived as like you know overzealous feminism or whatever but you, you kind of need to have that conversation push for it and some people are just going to be a lot more receptive and then i would say grow that relationship and see where it goes um, there are people in the community you just got to go out and find them no the art of networking <laughs> yeah networking events um, meetups and things like that. Uh, all the like, I think rainforest is, is pretty good. You get to like meet a ton of people at, at the same time, and those people are really open to such conversations. Um, so definitely do, do rainforest, start up TNT, and things like that. Thank you. No, very. I think this has been very helpful for everyone uh, trying to uh, move their paths and careers. Um, or, or Vashin, do you want to have uh, that wrap? Up advice. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I was going to answer that that part as well, Luisa. So, um, for me, really, um, when it comes to opportunities, you know, um, uh, a take that I have is why not? You know, if if you are going for a new opportunity, uh, applying for something new, then even thinking, why not me? You know, I, I think that that's 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 a very good sort of mindset to to embrace. Uh, just the fact that you're uh, as qualified as anyone else in the room. Uh, again, that pizza come to, comes to mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, words that that I grew up with uh, that were really, uh, you know, uh, echoed uh, from from my dad. He would always tell me, "Be bold, be confident." And anytime I'm trying something new, uncomfortable, uh, those are words that I tell myself. Um, and you know, it's it's with those words that I actually experience a lot of growth and and uh, you know feel feel confident. So something that I'd like to share with everyone and, um, and uh, yeah, hope, hope that this is something that will empower you guys as well. Lovely, no, I love all these advices and, and yeah, it's go be bold. You have the skills, you're supreme pizza, be ready to order it and put it in the table <laughs> and look for allies. Uh, yeah, I think that's very important. Um, I find like community is ready to help. It's just we need to ask the right question to have the help for the community uh, because um, everybody's ready to help. So 